So here's what, here's what we're doing this morning. Uh, the title of this discussion this morning is uh, United States in 2012, what's class got to do with it? And uh, we invited and just thrilled to have this tremendous panel here, Bob Herbert, a uh, former columnist at the New York Times now with uh, Demos and a longtime observer and uh, articulator of the needs of uh, working people, Bill Fletcher uh, from blackcommentator.com uh, and the labor movement and the civil rights movement, Trans-Africa Forum. The man's been around, Fran <laughs> as has everybody here. Uh, Francis Fox Piven, distinguished professor at uh, the CUNY Graduate Center and longtime observer and commentator and participator as a citizen and as an academic and a scholar in the movements of the poor and the movements of working people. Juan Gonzalez, who is uh, uh, Democracy Now!, a co-host uh, of Democracy Now!, columnist at the New York Daily News, and a longtime activist going all the way back to the Young Lords and before. And uh, we have a panel here that I think is uh, got some stuff to say. So what we're going to do is we're just going to have a conversation. I'm going to sit down here and participate in it, and we're just going to see where it goes. But when we are t we're talking about this just a little bit, when we're talking about class, uh, we're talking about power and power relations. It's not just a question of income. It's not just a question of lifestyle. We're really talking about power relations in the society. So if we're talking about what class has to do with it in this era right now, that's a very uh, central feature of uh, what we're going to be talking about. And before I take my seat, let me just get us started. Um, we had an opening uh, plenary session the other day uh, on Thursday night with Jeff Clements, uh, whose book, uh, uh, corporations are not people, I understand, is the best seller up at the bookstore upstairs, uh, which reminds me, there is a bookstore upstairs. Uh, on the third floor where all the conference sessions are, we encourage you to go and pick up uh, books there. There's a 20 percent discount. The Center for Study of Working Class Life also has a store up there with uh, posters and with DVDs, and there's some good stuff there. But at any rate, Jeff Clements uh, was here talking about Citizens United. And um, one way to think about that uh, that I've heard uh, articulated is that Citizens United, of course, didn't come out of nowhere. In a certain way, you could think of it as the victory dance of the capitalist class after a 40-year march down the field to uh, touchdown land where they really finally got uh, a chokehold on the political process. So we're living through that in Wisconsin, we're living through that in, in the challenges out in Montana and the challenges that we have in everyday life with the labor movement and so on. So I just want to just start here, maybe, I don't know, at the end with, uh, right here with Juan, you want to just start in, wh where are we with this and how should we understand what our tasks are as academics, as union activists, as community activists, as journalists, what are we doing here? Well, 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 uh, speak well, into well, the microphone. Well, uh, can, can, is that that better? Yeah. Well, I, I think in terms of uh, this, uh, uh, we were disc we were talking before the the panel started about this whole uh, issue of this uh, fixation in American politics with the uh, middle class. Uh, which to my mind is uh, really an attempt uh, to, um, uh, to continue to confuse uh, the, uh, the vast majority of the American people. The, the key aspect of constantly raising the middle class to my mind is to exclude by, um, is to exclude the, the poor and the uh, unemployed uh, from the concept of the people and to exclude uh, immigrant labor. Uh, from the concept of what is American politics geared to. So there's, uh, there's been a historic problem throughout our country in terms of the ability of the, uh, the ruling sectors of the society, helped us, assisted ably by my uh, colleagues uh, in the media, con con my contemporary colleagues and my historical colleagues, uh, in attempting to confuse the American people. 
Uh, you know, one of the, uh, I've been doing a lot of study in the relationship between the mass media and uh, class politics and racial politics over the last, um, uh, uh, over the last uh, decade now. And one of the things that I've come to understand is the mass media in America developed at the same time as the uh, mass of workers got the right to vote. Uh, the development of the first uh, penny newspapers in the 1830s were right around the time the propertyless workers got the, uh, the, uh, the franchise. And uh, because in a democracy, one person, one vote is a dangerous thing. Uh, and uh, so therefore, the role of the mass media in American society, the, the social role of the mass media, uh, has been to uh, help develop the consciousness of the mass of workers against independent action and against an independent sense of their agency in American history. Uh, and uh, so I think that Today, the way it's framed is that the politicians espouse and the mass media regurgitate this concept of the middle class uh, as an attempt to uh, create a, a buffer zone or a sense among uh, the people that uh, there is this other group of people <laughs> that are not part of the middle class that they have no relationship to at the bottom, the immigrants and the, uh, and the, the poor and largely people of color. Uh, and on, and those that they aspire to be <laughs> at the upper echelons. Uh, so I think that the, the key responsibility uh, for progressives in my mind is to reject <laughs> this concept of the middle class uh, and uh, to constantly raise that there is still a working class. Now exactly who's in the working class? Well, that's, <laughs> that's a matter for all of you that, who, who do this studying on a regular basis to define. Uh, but I think that uh, from my perspective uh, as a journalist, uh, buying into the middle class uh, uh, paradigm, I think, is the beginning of a, uh, a dulling the consciousness of working people in America in the 21st century. We'll just go down the, we'll just go down the line. Francis. I can do this. Well, you can Come on, this Come on, help me. Oh, oh. can do that. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Right into the mic. Frank. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, I want to raise a different but related issue, not about you know how we identify ourselves and the bulk of the population, whether middle class or working class, but I want to talk about our political situation right now or raise some of the issues uh, that emerge. I think more starkly as a result of the election in Wisconsin. Uh, everybody is talking about, aware of this dark cloud that hangs over us, uh, which is Citizens United. Now, it's not that we ever had that much confidence in electoral politics, uh, but we do know it's important. And with Citizens United, our ability to use electoral politics contracts now, why, why is that? Well, it's partly because, uh, I mean, Citizens United relays, re raises the problem of propaganda in American political life. It raises it, I think, very, uh, in a very big way. Prop <coughs> propaganda has always been a problem. It's always been true that in the information that all of us ordinary people process is largely controlled. It's always been true that some groups and the press and TV and so forth that they control have the ability to not only manipulate information, but to manipulate our emotions by evoking symbols to which we are very attached by making patriotism seem the same as your own little village. Uh, your attachment to your home. And all of this is propagated from the top, and all of this has been a big uh, sort of democratic deficit. It's, this is something that the working class left has always understood and tried to overcome, to resist. But it's so much worse now. It's so much worse now partly because economic and political life is ever more complex 
and it's very difficult. It's, in fact, it's insufferably difficult for people and their grassroots groups to try to develop a good understanding, a populist understanding, a working class understanding of what it is that is happening, of what credit default swaps mean, of what the Federal Reserve actually does, of what these trade deals mean, of what's actually happening in the nuclear react. I mean, these are all political issues, but they are so easily obfuscated because you can't know what's going on. I mean, I have a PhD. I've been studying this stuff forever. And, you know, it phases me. And it's also more, much more difficult because the mass media have so much more powerful a role in our everyday life and our understanding of the forces that determine our everyday life. So, and then, of course, all this sort of comes to a head or sort of a punch in the solar plexus with the results in Wisconsin, because in Wisconsin, we try to do what we are always telling each other we should do, which is try harder to make electoral politics work. And I think that labor and the left tried harder as hard as they could in Wisconsin at the very moment when, as a consequence of Citizens United, enormous amounts of money from everywhere in the country, but from the top, were flooding into Wisconsin. And we didn't lose entirely, but we did not do very well. So maybe Wisconsin is going to stand in historical memory as a kind of turning point where, you know, electoral representative democracy uh, sort of met its downfall. So what should we do under these circumstances? And I go back to what I've always gone back to, and even when things weren't quite as bad, which is the role of uh, popular movements, the role of mass upheavals, the role of defiance, the role of the ability of people, not necessarily majorities even, the ability of people to threaten to bring disorder, breakdown to important institutions. I think that this is the moment when that kind of social movement politics uh, is unfolding, it's growing, it ebbs and it flows and it's irregular, but it's there. It's there not only in the United States, but all over the world. And I think, therefore, that what we might talk about is what social movements, protest movements, defiant movements, disruptive movements, can do to help bring political sanity to the United States. Bill Fletcher. Thank you. Good morning. Um, there's so many things that are going through my head right now that I want to uh, touch on, so, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm just going to touch on a couple of things. Um, and, and I actually want to uh, start by this thing that Mike mentioned about Citizens United as a victory <coughs> dance and, uh, and also what Fran was talking about. So I tend to think in metaphors, and my metaphors are drawn either from uh, science fiction or from war. So this particular one is from science fiction. See, I don't think it was so much a victory dance. What I'm thinking about with Citizens United is more this film from the 1950s called When Worlds Collide. It was a great science fiction, classic science fiction movie in which this planet is coming towards Earth, actually these two planets, and one of them is going to crash directly into Earth. And this rich uh, capitalist basically funds a science mission to relocate selective humans to a world that will survive. 
I actually think Citizens United is something along those lines, that there are worlds that are colliding and that there's a segment of the capitalist class that is very well aware of this and that they are seizing the opportunity as quickly as possible to secure themselves uh, against what they perceive to be a pending disaster. And the pending disaster is us, the riffraff. Um, and it's a global problem because of the contradictions at the ecological level as well as the economic level. So I think that they're, they're trying to seize that. And it absolutely uh, puts us at a great disadvantage, but it's also one of, the, one of the things is that it's not the capitalist class as a whole. And this is not to uh, apologize for them, but it's that there are divisions within the capitalist class including about how to interpret Citizens United. Because if one segment is able to gain an advantage, then there's contradictions that really emerge within them that they can't resolve using the traditional methods of electoral politics. And when that happens, they, they have to start looking for extra legal and extra political mechanisms to resolve contradictions, which brings with it a great deal of instability. So that's part of the reason that we're seeing this debate. It's not that there's segments of the capitalist class that give a damn about what this means for us. It's that they get, some of them give a damn about what it means for resolving contradictions among them and whether or not they'll have to turn to other means. And that's something I think we're going to have to pay a great deal of attention to in the future. Um, the, the other thing is the... Um, uh, to, just in terms of, I, I can't resist talking about Wisconsin, because I feel that Wisconsin was a fight that we had to engage in. Sometimes you fight when the odds are against you and the situation is grim, to borrow the words of a hero of mine. And uh, you just have to do it. And um, 46, 47 percent of the vote, whatever it was, was not bad given what we're up against. But the problem is deeper that we have to really think, rethink the way we're doing electoral politics and also the labor movement has to really rethink something that some of us were talking about earlier, <clears throat> its relationship to its own members and particularly talking about issues of class, that the lack of real internal education in the labor movement, a lack of real class conscious education, the chickens have come home to roost. Everything that many of us were trying to do in the 1990s in the AFL with something that was called common sense economics, the fact that that didn't get followed through on, did not get expanded, we are paying the price. So when we look at these percentages and we see that even within labor, that segments of the, uh, of the unions went in favor of uh, Walker, we should, we should just simply not be surprised. Bob. <clears throat> Bob. That's right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming uh, today. Um, you know, I'm um, in the process of traveling this country and working on a book uh, that will be out next week, next year, next week, Friday. <laughs> I only wish it was over. Um, next year, keep your fingers crossed for me. It's called Wounded Colossus, and it's about some of the big challenges facing the country. And, um, you know, we're in much worse shape in the United States than the politicians and the media, mainstream media, would have you um, believe. I mean, we're in um, terrible trouble here. Uh, 50 million Americans are poor. That means officially poor. 50 million. Another 50 million are just a notch or two above the official poverty line. Now we're at 100 million Americans who are either poor or near poor, and that's almost a third of the entire population in this country. The middle class, the folks who think of themselves as uh, solidly middle class, whatever their political leanings uh, are, um, they may be progressive, they may be conservative, they may be right-wing Tea Partiers, I don't care, but if they think of themselves as um, solidly middle class, the truth is they're in deep, deep trouble and heading in the direction of the poor and the near poor. Because even those middle class families where uh, two people are working and they have decent incomes, they're faced with economic challenges that are profound. Look at what it costs to send youngsters to college nowadays. 
Uh, look at how many homes are underwater in this country, middle class homes. Look at what people are paying month after month after month for their mortgages, for health care. Uh, where once people bought homes and built equity and that was the way to begin to establish wealth and you could pass it on to the next generation, that's over. Now you, you, you don't even get an opportunity to build up much equity. You're just paying that mortgage month after month so that you have some shelter for if, if, you, if you're married for the husband and wife for, uh, for two or three kids. And there's no, um, and we haven't even uh, gotten to the cost of health care. There is no job security. So even if you're like uh, skating along all right for a few years, suddenly you may find yourself out of work and that home is at risk and you can't afford, afford college education for your kids anymore. Retirement is a fantasy. I talk to young people about retirement and that's not happening anymore. So we're in deep, deep trouble. And that middle class, if we're talking about political power in this country, forget about it. We no longer live in a functioning democracy. Trust me, we don't. This was happening even before Citizens United. Citizens United was simply the coup de grace. If you look at, um, we know that poor people are politically powerless. Nobody pays attention to the poor. Barack Obama won't even say the word poor. We have a Democratic president who has in the White House a task force on the middle class. Excuse me? What is going on here? So we have all these poor people and near poor people and nobody can even, uh, can even say the word. So we know that they're politically powerless. But the middle class is also effectively powerless as well because what the middle class needs and wants, they, they can't achieve through the political process either. They can't stop these wars that are going. We're in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, September 11th was in 2001. It is now 2012, and we're still in Afghanistan. We had that catastrophe uh, called Iraq. We can't even bring that to a close. Um, we can't put people to work. We lost about, I guess it's 14 million uh, uh, jobs in the aftermath of the uh, Great Recession. And people want to give a party if you can create 200,000 jobs in any given month. And we haven't even been able to do that. The middle class wants jobs, but they cannot effectively get job creation through the political process. The middle class can't get the infrastructure rebuilt in this country, which, be, which would be a source of new jobs. Uh, immediately and would, for, would provide a platform for new industries going forward. They can't get that done. The middle class can't get um, the uh, education system in this country uh, revitalized. And that was a cornerstone of building the middle class, however anybody uh, wants to define the middle class. Most middle class Americans sent their kids through public school. In fact, most middle class families still send their kids uh, to public schools. But the public school system is deteriorating and not just in the inner city. And then we've always had, um, or, or for the longest time at least, the finest higher education system in this country. And we are now undermining that. If you look at California, California set the standard. This is a great, we're at a great public university here. California set the standard for public universities, and Berkeley is probably the finest uh, public university in the world. What are they doing? They're defunding it. Um, uh, they're uh, laying off uh, professors. They're shutting down uh, programs. And they're importing students who can pay the full freight because American kids can't, can't afford the tuition. So we're in desperate trouble here. Um, uh, I won't talk any more uh, right now. I have some ideas about um, uh, some things that we need to do in this, con in this country, but we're going to, uh, I guess, keep the conversation going. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I listening to this and thinking um, about a couple of things. In, in, in Wisconsin, we, we, we heard that 38 percent of union households voted for Walker. And there's a lot of hand-wringing and a lot of, oh my God, how could that possibly be? And I, I was thinking, about a, a number that I, I, I saw a few years ago now where somebody asked this question of union members. Have you ever been involved in an organizing campaign to bring a union to your own shop or any other shop? 
This is union members. 5% said yes. 95%, and by now I'm sure it's a bigger percent, are in unions because the place has got a union and they got hired in and you're in a union. They may know what local they're in. They're in local 246. Of what? I don't know. I have students here who are in unions. They're in local 246. And I say, well, what is that? What, what union? They don't know. They don't know what a union is. They don't know where the union came from. So the fact that they're union members basically has zero political content to it. And that comes to, again to what uh, Bill uh, Fletcher was saying, that if you've got a labor movement that doesn't represent consciously, openly, and clearly its members and its class, it isn't going to be able to function as the labor movement that we need to respond to a capitalist class which knows who it is and which is going to be organizing and which is going to be in a systematic way trying to advance its power as it moves down the field. So it, it, it brings me back to this question of, well, what is this labor movement? Here we are in working class studies. It's not the same thing as labor studies, which uh, I mean, our agenda is a little bit broader. But I, I'm thinking, uh, again, of an article that that Dan Clausen uh, wrote with uh, Alden Morris. Alden Morris is a sociologist, I think, out at Northwestern, who got his PhD here writing a history of the civil rights movement. And Dan Clausen has a book called The, the Next Upsurge that ca I think came out of uh, Cornell University Press. But they wrote a little article called uh, The Lessons of the Civil Rights Movement for the Labor Movement. And in that article, they point out that if you go back to the civil rights movement with the, in the 50s and 60s, where was the energy that, that really drove that movement? It was not from the NAACP. It was not from the Urban League. It was not from the organized, uh, consolidated civil rights organizations. It was from SNCC. It was from the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It was from new organizations that came up and challenged and, and did what, what, what Fran was talking about. They defied. They created disorder. They really challenged the structures of power. They weren't just against something. They were really pushing. And what this article, what Alden and, 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 and Dan came up with in that article was that the labor movement is probably going to look the same. If we look to the AFL-CIO, if we look to the established labor movement to lead this process of transformation that we need in this society, we're going to wait for a very long time. Those organizations are going to play an important role, but only as they're brought into the wake of a, a, a new labor movement, a new organization of the working class, which is not going to be what a, a, just a reflection of what has already been, but is going to be in the immigrant movements. It's going to be in the uh, movements of people of color. It's going to be among white people who are not in unions now. It's going to be in communities. It's going to take forms that we don't completely understand yet. But that, I think, is what we have to kind of look to, nurture, think about, and uh, participate in as, as it comes. So I'll just uh, throw that into the mix, and we'll just keep going. Yeah, I'd like to bring in another uh, aspect of the discussion, because I think we tend sometimes, when we look at the situation in this country, to get um, um, depressed <laughs> as to the, the ability of, of, uh, of, of people to uh, uh, overcome the confusion and division that they're being subjected to on a daily basis. And we forget that uh, a working class movement has to maintain, uh, most of all, a sense that uh, there are workers all over the world confronting the same problem. And one of the things that uh, is clear, has become clear to me, and I, I know to many of you, number one is the industrial heartland of the world shifted <laughs> over the last uh, 40 years from Europe and the United States to China and India and the third world. Uh, that is the heart of industrial work in, in the world today. Uh, and 
the United States can no longer control <laughs> uh, the world the way it used to. Uh, Latin America has broken free <laughs> uh, in the last 15 years of the Washington consensus and is charting its own role, is decreasing income inequality, uh, is providing more opportunity for social expression and participatory democracy. An entire continent <laughs> has gone in a different direction. Uh, not completely, but certainly in a more positive way than what is happening in the United States. Uh, the Arab world is charting its own course, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, always in the best uh, in the best way in terms of the uh, uh, of the continuing battles uh, over uh, the role of religion uh, in public life, but is certainly breaking free of the of U.S. and American control. So it seems to me that what has been happening, at least now in the last few years, is that. <laughs> The capitalists of the United States, desperate to find new ways to make more money, are now bent on reconquering Europe, uh, finding a way to drive whatever social uh, progress the European working class made uh, to take it away and somehow or other be able to refinance uh, new profits off a reconstructed Europe. Uh, and we have to see the positive aspects of what's gone on in other parts of the world. And I think that the reflection of that here in the United States is that the most class conscious parts of the American working class are the immigrant and third world workers uh, because they draw from that experience. Uh, so many of the major battles, the, the, the windows and doors, uh, factory takeover uh, in Chicago, uh, the uh, justice for janitors uh, in California, uh, uh, so many of the uh, pivotal battles of the American working class has come from immigrant workers, many of whom had their political consciousness not here in the United States. <laughs> they developed their political consciousness in Salvador, uh, in Guatemala, uh, in Colombia, uh, in uh, Jamaica, in, uh, in Haiti, uh, and they brought that consciousness when they came here uh, and they are reshaping uh, the consciousness of the working class uh, uh, gradually here in the United States. It is the immigrant workers who resurrected May Day in 2006. <laughs> so May Day was dead as a holiday in this country until 2000, May Day of 2006. And it was resurrected by the immigrant rights uh, movement and now even the organized labor movement <laughs> has had to respond and gradually, increasingly has even developed an uneasy alliance with all of these immigrant rights groups and is now once again celebrating uh, May Day rather than Labor Day because they realized nobody else was coming to their Labor Day marches anymore so that they had to somehow or other latch on to what was vibrant which was the May Day protests on the immigrant rights movement. So I believe that th the fact that the immigrant, uh, the immigrant labor activists are playing such a a combative role now within the labor movement is a reflection of the political consciousness that they are bringing to they, they are bringing to this country uh, as a result. Because you know, a lot of times people are, uh, you could see you could have a a maid in a, in a hotel or a kitchen worker in a restaurant that's in uh, uh, that, that's in here and that they, they don't speak. English well, you, you, don't, you know, they may not have much education, but you have no idea what they have gone through in their own country, what kind of struggles they already went through before they got to this country, uh, and that they have much more labor consciousness and understanding, and they're bringing that. They're bringing that consciousness here like the, the Russian workers uh, of the early 20th century uh, brought to the United States, like the Italian anarchists brought to the United States. They're bringing a whole new sense of political consciousness and class solidarity. The problem is that the structures in which they enter <laughs> want their membership and want their dues, but don't want to give them the opportunity to rise and take actual leadership uh, within uh, many of these unions. And so I think it's in, uh, incumbent upon uh, conscious and progressive labor activists to help open the doors uh, to uh, uh,
uh, your unions and, and the unions that you work with to be able to um, uh, provide an opportunity for, those, for these new rising leaders uh, to uh, play a bigger role? Uh, I think that Juan suggests a uh, focus for the discussion or what we have, what time we have left for discussion that I agree with. Uh, we could talk about the changing character of the American ruling class and the new cleavages within the ruling class and its incredible short-sighted and predatory practices. Uh, you know, like it doesn't believe it has a future for its grandchildren because it wants to eat it all now. And what it's going to eat is going to be taken from the poorest people in the United States. This is sort of an incredible moment uh, if you're interested in the behavior of ruling classes. Or we could talk about the corruptions of American democracy yet again and how they're even worse. A lot of things we could talk about. But what I think we should concentrate on because of who we are, who is gathered together in this room, is the politicization and revival of the American working class and its union instruments. Uh, the, what are the possibilities for a labor revival? And I don't think that the AFL-CIO is going to accomplish it. It's just not going to happen that way. It's not going to happen by electing a new leadership, a Sweeney or a Trumpka or whatever. And it's not going to happen just by relying on the immigrant workers either, or even including the African American workers, so many of whom are now union more than white workers, I think, proportionally, uh, and who also have bring, bring to the union experience a political consciousness uh, which is more informed, more enlightened. Uh, than the mass of uh, union members. How we, we should focus on how to revive the working class movement and its union instruments. But I don't think we begin with the unions. I don't think we begin with talking about how to improve democracy in the unions or uh, get union leaders not to worry so much about their pension funds and the building that they own. We begin with how to revive the working class movement. That is what we should talk about for the rest of the conference. Um, since Franz says it doesn't matter who heads the AFL-CIO, I guess I have to stand back from announcing my candidacy for president of the AFL-CIO. Um, I, uh, I want to pick up on this and, and some, a couple of things that, that Juan was saying, but from a sort of different angle, because I think it's, it's central to this question of any kind of labor revival. How is it that precarious whites, economically precarious whites, can see in Romney a champion? I feel like that's, if we're going to talk about class in the United States, we've got to like, look at that straight, you know, right in the face and not fear the results. How is it that economically precarious whites can look at Romney? Now, I, I've read different things about this and after this poll came out that were basically talking about, well, people are disappointed in the Democrats, et cetera. Well, I can get that. I understand the disappointment in the Democrats. But why Romney? I mean, you can be disappointed in the Democrats and move left, but moving right into this, this fool's paradise is something that I think we have to grapple with. So, and I actually think in a peculiar way it is related to this issue of middle class and something Juan was raising before. And this, this the difficulty in building solidarity, the, build, the difficulty in building class consciousness is the inability to, to, to address this issue of race. And, and so in that sense, you can't have a discussion about class in the absence of having a discussion about race. Because to the extent to which white workers continue to see themselves in a different economic sphere than people of color, their definition of middle class, or the use of the term middle class, is to borrow from what Juan says, an escape, a, a, a place to escape to and to differentiate themselves from uh, this dark sphere at the bottom of the economic ladder. 
So I think when we're talking about a revival of labor, we've got to understand, and this is one of the issues that I've had for years with um, discussions within the labor movement, it's not about organizing tactics, fundamentally. It's not even about organizing strategy. It's not about whether you put 30 or 40 percent of your budget into organizing. It has to begin with a, a reshaping of the whole concept of unionism and who we're actually trying to organize and what we're actually trying to accomplish. And that really does go towards redefining class. Uh, I think those comments are, uh, that Bill just made are really um, important and uh, begins to get to the heart of um, our very serious problems in this country. Uh, one of the things we have trouble doing is coming up with a coherent message. I mean, we dance around um, everything. And even when we talk about the working class, um, if you talk to 15 different people, you're going to get 15 different concepts or definitions of uh, who, who comprises the working class. Um, so I think that we need to start uh, developing a more coherent um, message on what we're trying to achieve in this society and then who we need to galvanize to reach those goals. And I think that the um, sort of the um, unifying issue around which you could rally the largest number of Americans is employment, because that is so crucial uh, to the lives of uh, nearly all Americans uh, going forward. And I think that if, um, uh, you know, the important thing that uh, Bill mentioned is if you don't address this race issue, then you're almost lost from Jump Street because you can't rope in uh, the people and the thinkers and the ideas and the creativity that you need to achieve definable goals if you have a big segment of the population that has not been enlightened about the divide and conquer tactics that have harmed so many for so many, for so many decades. So I think that, um, yes, you need to address the uh, um, racial issues. You need to start, uh, you need to have a compelling, coherent message to explain to people who are on different uh, rungs of the economic ladder, but who are not uh, doing very well, um, any of them, why, um, why their interests coincide, why they should be making a uh, common cause, uh, who the enemy is, who is oppressing working people. When I talk about working people, I don't just mean the traditional working class. I mean anybody that has to work for a living in order to survive in this country. And that is the vast majority of Americans and includes the majority uh, and probably the vast majority of the um, middle class. So I would say, uh, one, you have to work on this uh, race issue and begin to fight back against the divide and conquer strategies. Two, I think you need to define employment as the most important issue confronting the largest uh, number of Americans. And then I think that we need a cadre of really smart and creative thinkers to begin to put together a program that is not going to be a short-term program. This is not going to be solved in the short term. This is going to take, uh, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. I think we need to be looking that far out. Look at how long it took for labor to get its act together to get into that post-World War II era. Look how long it took for the civil rights movement to get past that 19, get up to and past that 1954 Supreme Court decision. Look how long it took, how many waves of the feminist movement it took just to get women to the status that they are in the United States right now. I think we need to be looking in the real long term. What I want to do now is just make one more fairly quick pass through and then have some questions, uh, uh, even just a few. Uh, but I, I, I want to say a little bit about this uh, question of race, poverty, and the way we understand class. And here I think the question of language 
in this theme of this conference, one of the themes, middle class, working class, what's the difference and why does it matter, comes into play. Because if we think in the popular jargon that most people are in the middle class and there's a fringe of rich at the top and a fringe of poor at the bottom, what that feeds into is exactly the kind of racial divisions that we now need to overcome. Because what that s sentiment is, is the middle class and then there's the poor. Well, who are the poor? Well, most people think the poor, that's black people. The poor is, ha has a racial, the poverty becomes racialized instead of classed. So what you end up with is an idea that's completely wrong from the actual life. Two thirds, uh, let's see, what is it? Uh, uh, two thirds of all poor people in the United States are white. Three quarters of all black people in the United States are not poor. So if you see a black person walking down the street and you say, oh, there goes the face of poverty, three out of four times, you are wrong. So I think that we need to really come back to the, the question of class and understand that the that when we're talking about class, we're talking about something that cuts across all kinds of races. And I'll just tell one quick story from New Orleans and from John Edwards' campaign where he started out his campaign for president in, 19, uh, in 2007, at December, in the Ninth Ward, Lower Ninth Ward, in New Orleans. Because he wanted to talk about the two Americas. And for him, the two Americas was the rich and the poor. And he was trying to get poverty. So he was standing in the lower ninth, surrounded by all these African-American families who'd been flooded out and not renewed. And I was looking at that and saying, well, gee whiz, if you really want to talk about poverty, why don't you bring some people from Jefferson County or Jefferson Parish across the river and have them there too? Because three quarters, even in New Orleans, even in the southeast New Louisiana, more white workers are poor than black workers. There are more of them. Higher percentage in the black population, that's true. But there, if all you do is say, oh, poverty is a problem and here its face is black, as progressive as you want to try to be with that, what you're actually saying is, what is, is wrong. And you have all these white workers who are looking at that and saying, well, what about me? And it feeds into and it reinforces the kind of racist sense that we're trying to overcome. And that's why I think that this, th th these questions of understanding class not as upper, middle, lower, but as a working class uh, is, is something which is a, an important analytic tool that we have to find a way to talk about. Can I comment, comment on that? Um, did I get a oh, yes? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I think your, 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 your points are important, but I do not think that we are going to be able to make an intellectual argument that redefines the views of race in this country. I don't think that you could get uh, racist white people from Jefferson County, uh, I don't think you can persuade them that they are, in some sense, have uh, a, 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 the same kind of interests as the poor black people of the low, lower Ninth Ward. What I think is a, um, might be a more fruitful approach is to talk less about poverty, because I, I, I agree w w with you and with Bill that poverty is seen as a black problem and whites do not want to be uh, associated with what's going on down there, even if they are down there themselves. Um, but the way to approach it, I think, is through employment, because that is the best way to alleviate poverty anyway. So if you start talking about people needing jobs, then you can talk to ab about the whites in uh, Jefferson County, you can talk about the blacks in the lower Ninth Ward, and you begin to get a convergence of interest that is not racialized. In terms of the racism in this society and um, the discrimination and the oppression of black people in the society, I think the answer to that, again, is not an intellectual argument. That then goes to the kind of things that Francis is talking about, I do not understand why black people in this country are not just out there so fired up, demonstrating in, in, in such a um, fierce manner 
um, defiant, outraged at what is going on. I, I, I just don't understand it. That's not the era that I came out of. What's happening to black people in this country is a disgrace and a horror, but I think black people ought to be rising up against that uh, themselves. But in terms of uh, if we're talking about class struggles and that sort of thing, then I think the way to get to address a convergence of interests is to talk um, uh, less about race in that context and more about employment. Uh, All right. Uh, so we're going to have Francis, then we're going to have Juan, and then Bill, and then we'll go from there. I, I want to comment on Bob Herbert's uh, suggestion, really, that we have a uh, Two uh, foci of our intellectual ideological work that we have to pay a lot of attention to. One is to find the unifying issue, and the unifying issue, he says, is jobs. And the other is we have to worry <coughs> about the divide and conquer tactics of the opposition. Uh, I don't think that jobs is a good enough unifying issue. Uh, the jobs issue has been the issue of the right. And they have successfully persuaded Americans that only somebody with experience at Bain Capital, or a lot of Americans, uh, can be relied on to restore the economy. That, you know, the jobs issue has always been the issue of the left. We've relied on it too much. We forget a very long working class history which understood employment as wage slavery. I think we need to open up on that issue. And yes, employment, but other sources of security as well. And we care about what kind of employment, doing what, producing what, at what price for the ecology of the country. So second, uh, I also think we have to pay more attention to the role of race in the success of the organized right in the United States over the last, what, decades maybe. Uh, have you ever been to a Tea Party rally? Well, I have. And you know what they yell? They yell, take it back, take it back, take it back. And you know what they're talking about? They're talking about taking the country back from those dark-skinned, foreign-looking people who threaten to become a demographic majority. And they are taking it back. One of the reasons for the changes in voting rights that are being pushed through in the states that are controlled by the organized right is that they don't want those newcomers to have the vote. So I agree with you on the importance of the race issue, but we have to have a response to the race issue where solidarity across racial and ethnic lines is absolutely the center of our politics. All right, can I, I have to comment here. That's not going to happen. I've been in the United States long enough, and I've been up here in the North, and we are not going to get solidarity across racial lines in this country. The racism is too deep. The uh, sense of white supremacy is too fierce, too entrenched. The evildoers in our society are too well organized, too well financed, too evil for us to make an argument that is going to result in racial solidarity. We've had the civil rights movement, we've had the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and we're going to go on uh, forever. Um, the way for blacks to get equal treatment in this country is to do it the way they did it in mid-century. It's to fight back, and it's to fight back fiercely, and to not accept anything but victory. But that is going to have to come from black people, because I don't think that we're going to get sort of like this across the board uh, good feeling. We have a black president right now who can't even say the word black in this country. That's how entrenched the racism is. He's afraid that if he mentions the word black, he won't get reelected. He might not get reelected in any event. So I just don't believe 
that whether we're talking about uh, class or any other issue, that we can sort of wave some kind of magic wand and get some kind of racial comedy in this country. It is not happening. I don't believe that for a minute. Yeah, well, um, uh, I want to say, I mean, I, I agree with, uh, with Bob that the entrenched nature of white supremacy in this country is, uh, is amazing in its ability to continue to persist uh, generation after generation. Uh, however, I do think that, uh, you know, there was um, a study in the, I, I guess it was in the Times about two years ago that talked about what white society, what American society was in the 1950s, <laughs> uh, where basically you had a racially uh, segregated society, but pretty much homogeneous that as a result of the decline of immigration after, uh, during uh, the uh, World War uh, period, th the society was basically white and black, and, 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 uh, and the, the, uh, both African Americans and white Americans lived in their own worlds. <laughs> so there was racism, but there was homogeneity in the country. The country has changed dramatically. The young people of today are, are different <laughs> from those people who are in their 60s. The, 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 even white Americans of today, the young people are very much different in their attitudes and their understandings of the world than are the Americans who are in their 60s and 70s and who have a disproportionate, obviously, influence over the public uh, discussion. Uh, so that I think that there is a opportunity for change uh, in the new generation of Americans. Uh, the problem is that the ruling circles of the society need these kinds of divisions, need to continue to foster them. And again, as a, I'm a journalist. That's where I spent all my entire life. And I have to tell, and, and I think Francis mentioned earlier, the, the, the huge impact that the media have in the discussion, uh, in the consciousness of, 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 of what everyday Americans understand to be the reality in which they live. And I think that, to me, the great failure of the American labor movement has been its failure to understand the critical role that mass media play in shaping public consciousness. That it is not an issue of being able to organize people into organizations and getting them out to vote or it is shaping the public discussion and the public consciousness. And the virtual total absence of a working class or labor perspective in the mass media in America, to me, is the great problem. That there is no alternative consistent message that the American people receive about the importance of labor in American society, the importance of a working class, because there is no independent existing viewpoint. Uh, this, what newspaper in America is campaigning against, uh, against uh, the economic divide? I mean, newspapers, when they decide they want to campaign on, on an issue, they, they strike out at it. Uh, not just with one article, but two articles, but with editorials. What newspaper in America is waging a campaign uh, uh, around the economic divide in the country? None of them. <laughs> Uh, and, this, and the TV stations don't care because they're making all the money, all of, all of the Citizens United. Who's making all the money off of Citizens United money? It's the TV stations that are running the ads of all of these interest groups. So they are all lock, stock, in, uh, united with the message uh, to maintain the, uh, the working class in a subservient position. So why labor needs an independent uh, voice. Uh, in the media, uh, and I don't mean an or from organized labor necessarily, but it, it, until we have that, we have no way to be able to reach the masses of people on a daily basis, 24-hour basis. Uh, we've tried to do some of that with Democracy Now! with just one show. We've had phenomenal success with just one show. And that's only one show in 15, uh, in 15, 16 years. But if there was more orientation to pre providing a different perspective and consciousness on a daily basis, I think you'd see some kind of change in, the, in, the, in the, what people are thinking about when they deal with uh, working class issues. Bill. Um, so I, I think that uh, 
I actually don't think, Bob, that Fran was suggesting a wand. Um, but I also don't think that there's anything that's inconsistent between a militant African-American movement and the fight for working class solidarity. In fact, I think that the fight for working class solidarity increases to the extent to which African-Americans are ferocious. Um, and decreases to the extent to which we're passive. That when we're passive, I don't see hope for solidarity. When we're active and when we're fighting, that's when we're able to start chipping away at this edifice of white supremacy and start raising some questions as we have in the past within a segment of white America that we would aim to win over. And, and that's the, the the focal point of my thinking, which is the notion of building a majoritarian block. And a majoritarian block does not mean the majority of white people. I don't believe we're going to get the majority of white people, this side of socialism, to do anything progressive. What I do think is that it's possible to build a majoritarian block within this country, however. And, but that's going to necessitate what you were saying in terms of uh, this militant African-American movement, but it also is going to necessitate class politics that really is looking for the building of alliances uh, and, 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 and uh, the deconstruction of, of um, this racial myth that, that exists that is held very highly uh, by white Americans. And that's one of the reasons that we desperately need a left. Not a left that's just simply issuing papers, but a left that's actually engaged in some level of struggle and building organizations that bring people together across these barriers that are often perceived to be insurmountable. So I don't think it's a question then of wishful thinking or hoping that we can be in a kumbaya situation. I think it's about what is the, no the nature of class politics. So my final point is that within organized labor, I think that the notion of class politics has for the most part been restricted to the lowest common denominator economic alignment. And that has failed in the past. It will continue to fail. Class politics in the United States is going to necessitate cracking the racial divide. I just want to make one more comment here. I do not think for a moment that a more um, militant posture on the part of blacks on the race issue is incompatible with um, a movement on behalf of advancing the interests of the working classes in the United States. I think that they should go in tandem and very often can work hand in hand. But I think that they are still separate issues. I think that if you are going to talk about building a working class movement and then expanding that, because I think uh, in terms of uh, more than what we've traditionally called the uh, um, working class, and I think of anybody who has to work for a living in order to, to survive. If you are talking about building that kind of a movement, I do not believe that if you put a big focus on race in building that movement that it will be successful because people will bolt, they'll never come in, whites will bolt, they'll never come into that movement. I think that you need a, um, a militant movement for racial justice, that should have started long ago. I think you need that, but I think that that has to be um, uh, initiated and uh, uh, by black people because it, I don't believe that whites are going to do it. I wish that everybody would do it, but I don't think that that's going to happen. So I think blacks need to take the lead on that. Now, separate movement is a movement that has to do with uh, improving the quality of life of the majority of Americans of all colors 
And I think that the, fu the foundation of that in this country is employment. The reason I think that we have not been successful on the employment issue is because we haven't had a coherent message on employment. We have not had uh, progressive policies on employment. And Obama has failed to do what is necessary to begin to put large numbers of Americans um, back to work. I guess that's as much as I can say on it. Well, I think uh, we have only about 10 minutes here, uh, and that's pushing it out a little bit. So there's a, a floor mic here, and we'll take like two questions, or just come on up. Just come, just come to, this, to this mic right here, and let's see whether we can't get something from the floor. Uh, Liz, if you wanted to come up. So, I think that that, that works. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to follow up with... The, uh, here. I can actually talk while I'm No, that's not... No, you can't. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on something that Bill said and dis disagree, maybe particularly with... Well, well, disagree, p perhaps, with what Bob Her Herbert was saying. That it seems to me that there have always been two approaches to trying to get some sort of class unity. One is picking lowest con common denominator issues and going forward with that. And my understanding, there's four brief periods in American history when majorities of whites have supported civil rights issues for blacks. And these were all periods of intense struggle. One was during the American Revolution. There's a new book by Alan Gilbert called Black, pa Black Patriots and rebels, which talks about, he argues, but the near triumph of abolitionism uh, at the time of the American Revolution. Second period is during Reconstruction, after the Civil War, a brief period when whites and the 13th and 14th Amendment were passed by overwhelming majorities of whites in the North. And there are very strong amendments, and there was sympathy for what was happening to blacks in the South for a very brief period. The period when class was most integrally involved, in my understanding, is, is in the 1930s. And particularly, in the, the only really successful organizing in the South was done when the racial issues were pushed to the fore. And blacks were not, and whites were not one to these issues by, by persuasion or persuasion alone. It was during periods of intense solidarity on issues that they cared about and issues that blacks were central to. And those were pushed against the tenor of most of the CIO by communists who were uncompromising on that issue. And this was their best period and their best issue, it seems to me. And the fourth period was during a couple years of the civil rights movement, maybe 1963 to 1966, when whites showed some sympathy for the, for the struggle and also there was more unity. And I think that Sweeping those issues under the rug always leave, or, or not highlighting them always leaves the movement vulnerable for those issues being raised and undermining the movement. And that's been happened in dozens of cases. That was true of the post-World post War II period when the CIO excluded the left and tried to organize the South and downplayed racial issues. And there are dozens of examples of when that's happened. And it seems to me that that's a strategy that always has failed. I disagree vehemently. Few people are as in favor of integration in this society, in all aspects of this society. Few people are more interested in that than I am. But whites, a majority of whites have never favored equal rights in this country. Never, ever, ever. It's never, ever even been close. A, a majority of whites voted against Barack Obama for president in just this past election. They voted for McCain and Palin over Barack Obama at a time when the uh, economy was collapsing in a heap all around us. So it is a fantasy to talk about the idea of a majority of whites supporting the rights of blacks. Every time blacks move into a neighborhood, still whites flee. The employment discrimination now 
is incredible. It's a horrific problem in this country. Nobody will talk about it. What's happening in the streets of New York with the NYPD is outlandish. What's happening with voting rights, with uh, what, what people have uh, just said about what goes on at the Tea Party. You have a black hockey player in this country and he gets mocked and when he goes in the gyms around the country. So this idea that a majority of whites at different points in our history favored equal whites for, for blacks is just not the case. So wait, 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 wait. No. One more here. I, I think we're just going to have this comment and then maybe have one minute for everybody and then we're going to have to be done. I'll try and keep mine short, but I have a, long, a lot to say, but I'll just keep it very, very short. Please do. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Let me, let me just say, I, I think the panel was great. I think they have a lot of great points. Uh, intellectualizing thing is one thing in terms and doing it is another thing. Clearly, I've been a man of action. I've been dealing with a lot of stuff. Uh, I'm looking at what we're looking at now. We're looking at a class situation. We're talking about a situation in which reconstruction is still happening. Blacks have not achieved equality. Immigrants have not achieved equality. But we do have on the front lines a lot of people white people, black people, brown people, yellow people who are out there fighting every single day. What needs to happen is that sometimes they're fighting on their own instead of fighting together. We have got to find ways to come together, transmit our messages, merge our cultures, understand our languages, understand our histories, and then we can start moving together in a class way. Class right now is basically, and it's been broken down very well by the panel here, that we have that, that still situation even in the labor movement. In the labor movement right now, we have lost our class. We have lost the leadership of that class. Right now, we've, we've even given up education. So when we throw money at something, it doesn't mean the class is listening because they haven't been conditioned to listen. They don't know the history. We are looking at a situation in which labor has been defined as this class piece. Labor has lost that, and at this stage of the game, we have to start rebuilding that. All right, I think what we'll do is just quickly start from Juan, we'll go across to Bob, and then we'll be done. Yeah. yeah. All right. Are there more people from the floor? <laughs> like, here's one. <laughs> well, uh, who, so who was just up here? The, we'll, we'll just keep going. But, you know, we just, we just have to uh, be mindful of the schedule here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Gee whiz. The people on the panel don't have to talk so All much. right. <laughs> so we got four people here. <laughs> Uh, hi. Um, first, I want to thank you all. Um, and I want. Okay, can you guys hear me? Um, uh, so, thank you to the panel and uh, Dr. Piven. I want to relay a message that uh, from a friend that psychologists understand your work and we are working to help. Um, and my question relates to uh, Dr. Zweig's point about uh, students or kind of a younger generation um, not understanding what unions are. Um, I'm involved in student government here at Stony Brook, and uh, part of my work was trying to get people to sign their union membership cards. Uh, and I get a response often that I'm not political, so I'm not interested in this. And I wonder what you guys think is sort of the underlying thing of kind of it's cool to not be political now, and what we can do to change that. Pass the mic down to uh, I think that we should have mentioned and had Speaking some more discussion about gender. Speaking because if all men in Wisconsin were disenfranchised, then uh, Scott Walker would have lost the election. Because most of the women voted for Barrett. And so I think we have to have a discussion about uh, masculinity and reaction. Uh, and if we don't have that discussion, then we're, we're losing a long part of the discussion about the construction of class. I, I, I'd like to, I hope, clear up 
what I think is a misunderstanding in the recent exchange. Uh, when we're talking about building a majoritarian uh, working class movement, that is not assuming that a majority of whites are uh, willing to accept a non-racist view. What it does say is that you can build a majority overall with the participation of whites, not a majority of whites, but enough whites to therefore make the total thing a majority. I Thank completely you. agree with that, by the way. So we don't have a disagreement then. No, 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 I'm, I'm agreeing with him. Yeah, we all agree on that. Hello? Can, you can hear me? Uh, I hesitated because you asked the questions, but since people are offering opinions, I'll go very quickly. Um, I think that, and this is coming from 33 years in the labor movement and as many years trying to write some history. Start again. Can, now you can hear me? Yeah. Put it right to your mouth. Okay, I apologize. I want to offer some comments, which I hesitated initially because I thought we were doing questions, based on my 33 years in the labor movement and as many years trying to write some history. I think that we all recognize this crisis is deep and deepening and it's shaped in a white supremacist fashion. We're all very clear on that. I think, I think the argument could be clearly and easily made that the principal retardant to class consciousness in the history of this country has been white supremacy. I think we would all probably agree on that. I think in, if we look back at three previous crises, 1870s, 1890s, and 1930s, each and every one was beat back by ruling class turns to white supremacy. We have to learn the lessons of history. Very specifically, the 1930s was done, and Katz Nelson puts out a book when affirmative action was white. Each and every program and policy, federal program and policy from the 30s into the 60s was shaped in a white supremacist fashion. Your labor laws, FLSA, National Labor Relations Act, Social Security, the GI Bill, Seven, we're right here in New York area, New York, North Jersey area, 70,000 GI loans for, for a to purchase a home, less than 100 go to families of color. That's how we get these lily white suburbs. So what I think, um, I think, but I think we've had some suggestions for the way to proceed. And I think we can learn again from history because in the 1960s, that civil rights, black liberation struggle, which was both civil rights and independent and, and which hit at the question of white supremacy directly, was a catalyst for every other movement, the labor movement, the women's movement, what people are raising here. And we have, so I think we need to focus in our struggles as a labor movement, as a working class movement, as a movement from below, at every level, every step on the struggle against white supremacy. One last thing on this question of, quote, how many quote, whites will be involved in, I think, particularly for the European Americans in the group, we have to be very active in challenging what this white thing is, because I don't think you're gonna win people as whites. You'll win them as workers, and I think there's much that should and could be done in that area, and uh, I've got more to say on that, but thank you. I just have a quick comment in, time, in perhaps how to frame the rhetoric. Um, we can ask for jobs that's, I think, appealing to people, but we also have jobs that no longer have pensions or benefits, so there's a sense of the type of jobs. It's, um, I think if we, I want to suggest we try to shift the discussion to resources versus money. These often get confused in the way we talk to people. If, it isn't that uh, in public education we have a lack of teachers. Right? We have the social resources to educate children. It's the way money is being distributed. It's the way wealth is being distributed. We have 24 vacant homes, apparently, for every homeless person. If we start to get a sense, get people aware of the availability of the resources we have, and to try and shift the mindset away from thinking in terms of cash. I'm a literary scholar. So I say money, what, what is it? It's a poor representational system for understanding the resources that we have available. And I think if we begin to talk to people about resources, um, it creates a, a sense of shock when you say we have 24 vacant homes for every homeless person. Um, and get people to think about what's the kind of world they want. If they want a world with security, you don't want people walking around on the streets, right? Uh, if you want a, a world where people are educated, well, we have the resources. Um, I have found this effective in talking to people, uh, so I just want to suggest that, because that's really what we're looking for, is, 
is, to make, is a society that takes full advantage of our creativity. Obviously, that's the most productive society. And I think it's clear when you talk to people and you see unemployed people sitting around when you see vacant housing that we aren't taking advantage of all the resources we have available to us to create the optimal society. And I, I put in those terms, it starts to stretch across classes because the condition of alienation that Marx talked about is cross-class, but it's a condition of, that capitalism and class society creates. And it's, a, it's just a different way to talk about it that I find um, is appealing to people. Thank you. This will be very, very short. Two very short questions. So one is uh, referring to the classics. So first, uh, first question triggered by what Juan Gonzalez was talking about the immigrant workers and the false class consciousness and the role of the media. How do you see it in the future? Would the immigrant workers that come with a different class consciousness to this country subscribe to the false class consciousness that the media, partly media, creates for the working class in this country? Because we seem to see the attitude that people are not so much outraged by the huge income disparity, but envious of those who are on the top of this disparity. So this is one, one thing, the, the sort of lottery mentality, right? The, uh, the other question is to, to uh, basically everybody, a very short one too. Um, a, a, again, with the classics and what Lenny was saying about the revolutionary situations and everything that you have to have the masses that are incapable of surviving the situation, but also the part of the ruling class that realizes that the system can now continue even for them this way, right? So. We are talking, we are now here in the really middle of the 1% country. The, the average income in this, uh, this uh, neighborhood is probably, Michael knows it better than I do, but it's probably 120,000 per household, average, right? So still, among this 1%, you know, income uh, uh, country, you have lots of people who are very dissatisfied with the system, which sort of doesn't, doesn't translate to the action or doesn't translate to the political results, right? How they vote and how it happens. So do you see the, the, which, if any, part of the ruling class here could be really interested in changing the system and sort of for their own purposes, but still changing? Thank you. Well, we have a hot session going here. Uh, out of time. We're, we're, we're basically out of time, uh, so I think we'll just leave it there. Or do you want to go, shall we just pass it back uh, one more round? We're out of time. No. We're out of time. Right now, we're, well, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Uh,